Let us all pray. Father, before we offer you our prayers and praises, we need to be tuned to higher things. Before we speak to you, we ought to listen so that you may speak to us and that all our worship may be a response, a glad response to anything you have to say. We only love you because you first loved us. We only come here because you have come into our lives in some way. And so we gladly respond to the invitation. We have been busy about many things already this morning. Getting up and getting dressed, getting the breakfast, coming here, finding somewhere to park. So many things have occupied our minds so that we need to be quiet. And we ask that you will so speak to us during the first part of our morning service that when we come to worship, there may be no hesitation, no inhibitions within us, nothing to prevent us pouring out our souls in sheer love and adoration. We pray particularly this morning for our members on holiday. We ask that you'll bless them wherever they are. And on this lovely day, we know that their souls will be more than satisfied with the beauty of your handiwork as they see it in nature. But we pray that they may know more than that, the grace of the Lord Jesus pouring into their hearts, warming their hearts, filling them with love through the Holy Ghost. And once again, we pray that you will deliver us from any mental barriers that would prevent us from knowing the truth, the truth that will make us free, free from fear, free from boredom, free from sin, and grant that your people here may rejoice as they leave this building, for we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Yesterday morning I was sitting in the Odeon Cinema at the top of the High Street listening to Lord Robins, the Chancellor of Guildford University, give an address on the moonshot. And he always has something worth saying. And one or two quite memorable things, remarks he made about the flight to the moon. Uh, last Sunday night, I must confess, I didn't go to bed and stayed up all night to be a witness of this historic occasion. But what one of the things that Lord Roban said was this, that while it was an amazing achievement to get that man on the moon, what struck him as just as marvelous, if not more marvelous, was the fact that we could see it happen at the moment when it did. In other words, not just the miracle of getting there, the scientific wonder of landing a man there, but being able to share in it at the time. And certainly that's what constantly struck me while I strove to keep my eyelids open in the early hours of last Monday morning, that I could see them do it and hear them speak on a planet where there is no sound because there's no atmosphere in which airwaves can move. And we could hear them talk and we could see them do it. The marvel of communication which this represents. Now my subject this morning is the subject of communication. In our third and last study of the Holy Ghost's work in the book of Acts, this is the thing that strikes me about the many references, that in fact God had a problem of communication, if I could put it that way. Here is God in highest heaven, here are his people on earth, and he desires to communicate his thoughts to them. How does he do it? This is an even greater gulf to be bridged than the gulf between moon and earth, because the moon being a physical sphere and the earth being a physical sphere and radio waves being possible through space, there was a direct physical connection between moon and earth via radio. 
But from highest heaven where God dwells, which is a spiritual sphere, to earth which is a physical sphere, there is an even greater problem of communication, a problem which man, with all his technology, will never be able to solve. Because technology can only accomplish physical communication through some kind of physical law. But God is a spirit and heaven is a spiritual realm. And to cross the gulf between the spiritual and the physical world of physical people was God's problem of communication. Now when we study the Old Testament we found that God had many different ways of getting over that problem. For example, God wrote on walls. That was one way he got over the problem. Uh, men do a lot of writings on walls of various kinds, but God did it. And you find in the book of Daniel that God wrote on the wall of Belshazzar's palace a message which he wished to communicate. And the finger of God wrote many, many tekla pasin on the wall for Belshazzar to read. He also wrote the Ten Commandments with his finger on tablets of stone. That was another method of communication he used. Sometimes he sent angels who have the capacity to cross what no spaceman or astronaut has the capacity to do, to cross from the spiritual to the physical realm and convey messages in so doing. And so angels were another of God's methods of communication. Dreams were another. And sometimes God set the very air in motion in such a way that thunder was produced and thunder of a particular kind which formed the vowel and consonant sounds of language so that he actually enabled people to hear physically his voice through the thunder. That happened at Sinai, it happened at the grave of Lazarus in our Lord's day, it happened at our Lord's baptism and so on. But the main method of communication which God used for most of the Old Testament was the method of communication we call prophecy. This was the way he chose to convey most of what he wanted to say to earth. And prophecy is quite a simple thing. The word prophet means simply a mouthpiece. A mouthpiece. For example, when Moses went to Pharaoh, Moses was very unsure of his own speech, whether he had an impediment in it or not, we don't know. But he said, God, I can't speak to Pharaoh. And God said, Moses, you tell Aaron what to say, and Aaron will be your prophet. And that's almost the first use of the word prophet in the Bible. It means simply someone who will mouth a message given from someone else. So if someone tells you, uh, please could you go and tell Mrs. Smith so-and-so, so-and-so, I'll be round at four o'clock in the afternoon. If you go and say she'll be round at four o'clock in the afternoon, you are a prophet. You have simply conveyed words that you've been given to someone else. The message is not from you. It isn't a message from your mind. It isn't a message you had to think through. It is in no way your message except that your mouth spoke it, that's all. And this is what prophecy is. And God chose to reveal most of his truth, not all of it, but most of it, through the mouths of prophets from Moses to Malachi. And literally he says, I will put my words in your mouth. All you've got to do is to be willing to speak them out, whatever it costs you but I will put my words in your mouth. It is therefore a miracle of speech. The prophecies of the Old Testament didn't come from the minds of the prophets. It wasn't the prophets commenting on the scene around them. They were simply mouthpieces why Amos was just a market gardener, he says. I was a tender of sycamore trees. I'm not a preacher. But God told me to be his mouthpiece and I've got to open my mouth and speak what he puts in it, whatever it costs. Now this is prophecy. 
And there is one text in the book of Deuteronomy I want to read which tells us two things about prophecy. Uh, I needn't give you the reference. You can look it up when you get home. It's Deuteronomy 18.22 actually, but you don't need to look it up. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. Now that tells me at least three things about a prophet. One, that he will primarily be concerned with predicting the future. That is the main function of prophecy. To, to speak the words of God about the future. And clearly that is a miracle for nobody has the power to predict I know Dr. Von Braun is telling us there'll be a man in Mars by 1980. He cannot predict that with certainty. If a, the American economy collapsed between now and then, it would be highly unlikely, unless the Russians managed to do it. But no man on earth can say what is going to happen definitely in the future. God can because he knows the end from the beginning. And the gift of prophecy is primarily concerned with conveying to men and women the one area of knowledge that they are incapable of finding out for themselves. Those parts of the future which we need to know if we are going to behave properly in the present. And we need to know a lot about the future. We need to know how the world is going to end. We need to know what is going to happen after it does end. We need to know a whole lot of things that we don't know from any other source. And that's why the word prophecy has almost become a synonym for predict. You talk about somebody prophesying something about next week and you mean they are predicting. So while the prophets said other things, their primary concern was about the future. Secondly, it is quite clear that there could be such a thing as a false prophet who would tell you something which was not what God had put in his mouth. And the only sure way of finding out, of course, is to wait and see whether it happens. And that's what Moses says here. Now, of course, there have been many people who predicted the date of our Lord's second coming. And all of them have been proved wrong. Martin Luther did, John Wesley did, Russell did, who started the Jehovah's Witnesses, so many others have done. And they've all been proved wrong because they were not speaking what the Lord had spoken. And the third thing is when a prophet does speak, you need to be afraid of him. Why? Because he is talking about your future. He is talking about what God is revealing. And this is a fearful thing. And so Moses said, if it's a false prophet and it doesn't happen, you don't need to be afraid of him. But there is a healthy fear comes into a soul when you hear God speaking a word of prophecy. You'll realize that prophecy is nothing to do with preaching or teaching, which are quite different functions. Nor is it anything to do with commenting on social and political problems. Alas, today, this is the commonest use of the word in church circles, that the church has said a prophetic word about the social evils of our day. That is not what the Bible understands by prophecy. That is social and political comment of the minds of Christians thinking about a problem. Prophecy does not come from the mind of the church. It does not come from the mind of the prophet. It only comes from his mouth. It is as much a miracle of speech as the gift of tongues. The only difference is that the gift of tongues is a miracle of speech in a language you don't know and the gift of prophecy is a miracle of speech in a language you do know. In both cases, God supplies the words and all that is required of the person is the mouth. Now these two gifts, tongues and prophecy, are always linked or very frequently linked in both the Old and the New Testament. And if you read, for example, 1 Corinthians 14, you'll find the two gifts are interlocked in the life of the New Testament church because they are both miracles of speech. 
Now there is a gap between Malachi and Matthew, between the Old and New Testament of 400 years when there was no word of prophecy, not a word about the future. And prophesying only began again when Jesus, or about the time when Jesus was born. And then Zechariah prophesied, his wife Elizabeth prophesied, the Virgin Mary prophesied, Simeon prophesied, Anna prophesied, John the Baptist prophesied, he was the last of the great prophets and more than a prophet. And supremely Jesus himself was the prophet which so many people called him because he spoke the words of God and he said on more than one occasion, the words I speak to you I do not speak of myself. Only what the Father gives me, I speak to you, so that even the matchless words of Jesus were a gift of the Father through his mouth to us. But what I'm concerned about this morning is the book of Acts, because one of the things which the coming of the Holy Spirit made gloriously possible was the gift of prophecy for any believer. And when Peter tried to explain to the crowds who wondered what on earth was happening, he quoted Joel and said, It will come to pass in the last days that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Notice that. And at the end of that quote it comes again, And your men servants and your maid servants shall prophesy. In other words, this miracle of being able to speak the words of God which he gives in a known language to people for their comfort or strength or challenge is going to be given to any believer, be he male or she female, rich, poor, high, low, doesn't matter. And this is the gift which comes up in Acts. Now in the first half of the book of Acts it is the gift of tongues which seems to be singled out more than any other, perhaps linking that with the gift of boldness. But when we come to Acts 11, this gift of prophecy begins to be exercised and goes on through the rest of the book. And there are nine references to it in the book of Acts which I want to take you through and comment on briefly. Acts chapter 11, verse 27. And if you do look it up, this will convince you that this isn't David Pawson speaking, but the Acts of the Apostles. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. And this took place in the days of Claudius, which were in fact a bit later. And the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brethren who lived in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. Now here is a very remarkable thing. We have been accustomed in these days to hearing about famine. We've been accustomed to repeated appeals for help from Biafra, from India, from the Far East, from all over the world. It is almost becoming a commonplace so that we have our organizations set up, Oxfam, Christian Aid, Tear Fund and the rest. And as soon as they hear of famine or need, they channel gifts as quickly as possible to the need. But here is something completely different. Here is a man called Agabus, and I know nothing about him except that he prophesied by the Holy Spirit. And he said, there is going to be a famine. So let's get the fun ready now before it starts. Thus saith the Lord, there will be a famine. And we read that when it came, the people of God were ready to help their fellows. See how useful the gift of prediction would be so that things that come up, you are ready to meet them as soon as they come up. And this was a direct prediction which came true in the days of Claudius. Now that's prophecy. He wasn't a preacher. He wasn't a teacher. 
It wasn't his job to get up and give sermons. Agabus was a man filled with the Holy Ghost and he could prophesy. Now you notice that Barnabas and Saul were the treasurers of the relief fund and were sent with the money to Jerusalem. Those two figure again in the next reference. Chapter 13, the setting apart of two missionaries. We're going to do that in tonight's service, so it's appropriate we came to this this morning. Now, in the church at Antioch, same church, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, many and a member of the court of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Barnabas and Saul had been called of God to the mission field. They knew it. Other people knew it. But they had not yet gone. Why? Because they were waiting for the Holy Spirit to tell them when to go and where to go. For once you've heard a call to be a missionary, the when and the where become the main questions. And they did not have the answer. Now you notice it was while a group of five prophets and teachers were worshipping that the Holy Ghost said. Now how does the Holy Spirit speak? The answer is through prophecy. I used to think in my naivety before I ever understood what prophecy was that they must have had a kind of impulse or they took a vote on it or, or somebody had a thought about this and that this was how the Holy Ghost normally spoke. I know much better now. These were prophets and we are told that they were prophets so when they worshipped they expected the Holy Ghost to take someone's mouth over and put words in that mouth. And the Holy Ghost got up and said, separate me these two. I've called them, now you send them. Separate them from their home. Separate them from this church. Separate them from their daily work. Separate them from everything that engages them now and separate them to this work. Send them out. And so it says, so being sent out, not by the Early Church Missionary Society, the ECMS, if there was such a thing, which I don't think there was, nor being sent out by the Antioch Church with their blessing, but being sent out by the Holy Ghost. They had no doubt as to who'd sent them out. There had been a word of prophecy. Now then, the third reference is in the same chapter. When they got to Cyprus, they got an interview with the governor. And they were really getting places with him. He was interested. And if the governor became a Christian, wouldn't it be wonderful? And then it all went wrong because a man who dabbled in black magic, who was the court conjurer, came along and he was furious. He saw his job in jeopardy. And he started trying to persuade the governor not to listen. His name was Elamas the Magician. That's what the word means anyway. And verse 9 says, But Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Now, there's a prediction, and a pretty horrible one. But Paul was full of the Holy Ghost, and Paul knew from personal experience that God could blind you. And he knew that this was a fitting punishment for those who deliberately set their face against God. If ever there was a, a description of the most terrible thing that you could do, it is here, to make crooked the straight paths of the Lord. Here is a straight road from God into someone's heart, and God is wanting to come straight down that road into that life. 
and you take the road and you twist it and you bend it and you put stiff hills in it so that God has difficulty getting through to that person. That's a terrible thing to do. And this magician was making crooked the straight path of God. God had a straight path into that man's heart and this man was making it crooked again. That's a terrible thing to do. And alas, I've known many, many people who did it. Somebody was getting interested in the gospel, they were getting near. And somebody else in their family makes crooked the straight path of God and dissuades them from going an inch further. Makes it more and more difficult for them to consider accepting Christ. That's a terrible sin. But the point I'm making is that Paul, full of the Holy Ghost, predicted his future and said, you're going to be blind. God has told me this and I speak it out. Sometimes a prophecy has to speak of punishment and many of the Old Testament prophecies did. Now the next reference is in chapter 15, verse 32. I wonder if you realize just how many references there are to prophecy in the book of Acts until this morning. So all the way through, there's more about prophecy than baptism. Baptism in water, I mean. And yet we pay great attention to baptism. Let us do the same to prophecy. Verse 32. And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, exhorted the brethren with many words and strengthened them. And these two men only flit through the pages of Scripture this once. Judas and Silas, we know nothing else about them. But we do know this, that a prophet is able to strengthen his brethren. He's able to make a church strong. He's able to comfort a church in the deepest sense. And the gift of prophecy is given to strengthen the body of Christ. Now chapter 16. When Paul's crusade plan went wrong. Verse 6. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come opposite Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. How did the Holy Spirit stop them? The word forbid means to say, don't go. It doesn't mean to put an impulse in their heart, a sort of a feeling that they shouldn't. That's not what the word is used. That's not the word. The word used forbid is to say, don't do that. As the little boy said when he was asked what his name was, he said, my name is Johnny Don't. That's what my mother always calls me. And he certainly knew what the verb forbidding means. That's what forbidding means. Johnny Don't. Spoken out. And it's quite clear again that Paul, who we're told had the gift of prophecy as well as the gift of tongues, that waiting on the Lord and saying, Lord, we're going to preach the gospel in Bithynia tomorrow, the Holy Ghost spoke and said, no, you don't. That's very clear guidance. And so they traveled on a bit and they said, well, let's uh, slip into this country here. And they came opposite Mycenae and said, well, let's go there. Or I'm getting it a bit, a bit mixed up. It was Asia forbidden first and then Bithynia. Now why did the Holy Ghost say no, no, no? The answer was shutting this door and shutting that door. He was driving them forward. Whenever God shuts a door in your face, don't look at the closed door or you might not see the one that he's trying to open. And sometimes guidance from the Holy Spirit comes in quite a negative way. Door after door will shut like that. And God is saying, don't consider any of these side turnings. There's a door ahead that I want you to use. And the door in front of them at this stage was the door into Europe. And the gospel came to Europe as a result of this negative prophecy. Now let's move on to chapter 20 and 21. Paul is nearing the end of his missionary journeys and there are three verses which I'm going to pick out and read together. 
verse 22 of chapter 20. And now behold, I am going to Jerusalem, bound in the Spirit, not knowing what shall befall me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. Now turn to chapter 21, verse 4. They have landed at Tyre, and having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. And through the Spirit they told Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. Now further down the same chapter, verse 10, they had moved on to Caesarea, and while we were staying for some days, a prophet named Agabus, here he comes again, came down from Judea, and coming to us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this girdle and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now here on three different verses, we have described for us ordinary men and women who predicted before it ever happened that if Paul went to Jerusalem, he'd be bound, imprisoned, and afflicted. Now, Paul still went. He said, I'm going to Jerusalem bound by the Spirit. I've got to go. But in this way, the loving Heavenly Father prepared this man for all that lay ahead, so that when it happened, it did not find him unprepared. And as our Lord set his face to go steadfastly to Jerusalem, knowing that he would be killed there, so his follower and servant Paul set his face to Jerusalem, knowing perfectly well what was going to happen. And he would never have known if the gift of prophecy had not been given. And from time to time, God wants to prepare his servants for something that lies ahead so that it may not find them unready or unable to meet the crisis when it occurs. Now let us look at the same chapter, uh, and rather a surprising thing, verses 8 and 9, which I jumped over. On the morrow we departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the Evangelist. And we shall see his evangelistic work in the study in this evening's service. Who was one of the seven and stayed with them. And he had four unmarried daughters who were prophetesses or who prophesied. Now these four unmarried daughters had the gift of which I have been speaking. And which is such a useful thing to the church of Jesus Christ. And the two things I want to say here, I'm tempted to say, I wonder if they remained unmarried because they were prophesied, because this could be an embarrassment to their husbands, being married to uh, a woman who could make revelations and personal ones at that. But that's a speculation, and I don't know if that was the reason. But what I'm pointing out is this. True to the promise of Acts 2, the gift of prophecy was poured out on women, now, I don't believe in women preachers or women teachers. I think that is unscriptural. And the same scripture which tells us not to have women preachers is perfectly plain and clear that women will prophesy in a church. And Paul allows this. Indeed, he encourages it. And he speaks in 1 Corinthians 11, the chapter from which we take the scripture we read at the Lord's table for communion services. We read there his instructions for women who pray and who prophesy. And I find that in Christian circles people go to extremes on this issue of women taking public lead. You either get those who say women must keep absolutely silent and do nothing, or you get those who say they can do anything. Whereas the scriptural balance is very clear. Not preaching and teaching, but praying and prophesying. And where that is observed, you have a wonderfully balanced ministry and fellowship. It's utterly clear. And it's there in the New Testament. 
And so if the Holy Ghost gives a woman a prophecy, it is not from her mind, so she is not exercising authority over anybody else, as she would be if she preached or taught. She is simply God's mouthpiece. And there were prophetesses in the Old Testament too. The final reference is in the last chapter of Acts, and this brings to an end our study of the Holy Ghost in Acts. Paul is now a prisoner. Paul is in chains. Paul is in prison in Rome. And to that prison there come a group of Jews who have heard that a Jew is in prison and they want to know why. And they've come to visit their fellow Jew. And this is what happens. He talks to them. He tells them about the kingdom of God and about Jesus and they don't like it. Verse 24, some were convinced by what he said, others disbelieved. And so as they disagreed among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You shall indeed hear but never understand. You shall indeed see but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull and their ears are heavy of hearing and their eyes have closed, lest they should perceive with their eyes and, their, and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn for me to heal them. Let it be known to you then that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. Now here we have Paul quoting a prediction made by Isaiah hundreds of years before that when the truth came to the Jews they'd say we're not interested we don't want to understand we don't want to hear we don't want to turn and be healed and then he adds a prediction in the Holy Ghost of his own this gospel which you've rejected I predict will be accepted by the Gentiles and I suppose that almost every one of us in this church this morning is a Gentile. And Paul's prediction is being fulfilled in this church this morning. A prediction he made in the Holy Ghost that the Gentiles would accept what the Jews refused. Well now we've looked at this gift. It is concerned with the future primarily with predicting things of which only the God who knows the end from the beginning has knowledge, and revealing those things to the people of God as far as they need to know the future, to prepare for it and to live for it. Now we come to the crucial question. We can see that this gift goes right through the New Testament. When we study 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, that's all about the gift of prophecy. When we study the letters to Timothy, Paul says, Timothy, remember the gift that is in you through the laying on of hands by prophetic utterance. And when we come to the last book in the Bible, the great book that unveils the future, the writer describes his own book as this prophecy. But is this gift still around? Is there any reason why it should not be? I know that prophecy is going to pass away. Tongues are going to pass away. Knowledge is going to pass away. When will these things pass away? When we don't need any more communication. When we're in heaven and see God face to face. When we know even as we have been known. We won't need knowledge then. We'll have it all. We won't need prophecy or tongues then because there's no need for God to communicate. Because there isn't the gulf, we shall all be with him in glory. And so this gift is quite clearly there, and still there, and still being exercised. May I give you a modern example of this from quite recent days? A year or two ago, there was a communion service held not many miles from here. And those who were gathered, perhaps 200 people, used the Book of Common Prayer. Those who are against things out of a book, let me tell you this story because the Holy Spirit spoke in a liturgical service. And they went through the Book of Common Prayer, Order of Communion, and they came to the collect for the royal family and they prayed for Elizabeth, our Queen, and 
uh, Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Charles, and all the royal family. And at the end of that prayer, as they paused, a lady got up and prophesied. And she said, Prince Charles will have an opportunity very soon to hear the gospel. Pray for him. And then the lady sat down. And there was silence and then 200 people broke off the communion service and prayed for the royal family and for Prince Charles in particular. Now I don't know if any of the people present at that service know what I know. And my knowledge came from a women's magazine that my wife was reading one day, some months later. And my wife said, there's a very interesting article here about Prince Charles, and there's a bit in it about his religion. And she passed it over to me. And this was the usual article about the royal family with all kinds of personal habits and all sorts of things publicly paraded for us all. But in this paragraph, it said this. One weekend, while Prince Charles was in Australia at Timbertop Camp, he went on a, a weekend trek into the backwoods, into Aborigine territory. And on the Sunday morning, he saw a corrugated iron shed out in the backwoods of Australia. And he went to it, and it was an Aborigine mission hall. And he went in for the service. It was more lively and noisy than anything he'd ever been in his life, having been carefully brought up. And he went in and they sang their choruses and they clapped their hands. But he wrote home to his mother, the queen. And he said something like this. I think I now know what real Christianity is. And I said to my wife, could we work out when that would be? And we worked it out. And it was just after the service, not many miles from here. Now only God knew that. And I don't know until I've told you if anybody else knows the sequel. But that's what happened to the future King of England. And a word of prophecy in a Church of England communion service just enabled people to pray. Can't you see what a lovely gift that could be? Can't you see how God longs to speak to his church direct? Not just a prepared sermon from the man who is there to do it though that has its place. And in the New Testament, there are teachers whose job it is to do what I've been doing this morning. But prophecy has nothing to do with preaching. Prophecy can be exercised by anyone who's filled with the Holy Ghost. It is a gift for the body of Christ and a gift that has been given and never withdrawn, not to my knowledge, and is waiting to be claimed. Let us pray. Oh God, it was marvelous that men could communicate over all those many miles, but we praise you now that you can communicate with us and that we can commu communicate with you now. We thank you for your word and we thank you that you are a God who speaks and that through the ages you have spoken and put words into people's mouths. Oh God, our heavenly Father, help us to listen. And help us to obey whatever you say, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.